Good afternoon. It's good to see you all here today. Uh, Pastor and Judy are spending time with family today. Um, and uh, we have Mr. Glenn Rogers with us today. And uh, you, you need to get a shorter title. Associational, Minis Associational Missionary for the Seminole Baptist Association. I'll say that three times fast. So, and then we're going to have uh, uh, our missions moment with Dean here. But first, let's start off with prayer. Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together. Lord, we thank you that uh, we have a place to come and visit. Father, I pray that, uh, that your spirit will be felt today. Lord, and that the, the music and the message will touch our minds and touch our hearts, Lord, and that we can use it for the rest of our lives. So, Father, as we begin the service, Lord, I pray that, uh, again, our hearts and minds are on you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Well, I almost feel like I need to speak over here. Where is everybody from that side? It's kind of, anyhow, it works. We're just glad to be able to report this to you to you all because um, it wasn't that long ago I got uh, the, a note from Darcy uh, Berglund, but I got another one here that I just got to share some stuff from uh, because, you know, she talked about the Dems, and I'm not talking about Democrats, uh, some, <laughs> I'm talking about the Dems over in, in the, Indonesia. That's a tribe of people that and what's been happening among them i don't know well these people would remember what i said but it, the gospel had been uh well the foundational teaching had been presented to them and was continuing to be presented well you know now it's it's uh, done they finished the uh, the part up to uh, christ's uh, burial and resurrection and uh and uh they have explain this to, to make it, they trust that it's clear to the people because they've given the foundational teaching starting in Genesis. So I want to read just a little what happened here. There were many tears of joy in the dim villages this week as the gospel was presented clearly in the heart language. This was a culmination of about 70 lessons that began last January. Since then, over 400 people have been gathering to study every week, Monday through Friday. And I'll tell you what, that's a whole lot more than ever studied with me when I was teaching it that way in Paraguay. But then we didn't necessarily have that many people in the village either. But that was great. Over 400 people studying regularly. The team serving in the Dem tribe, tribe have been working hard to keep up with the teaching schedule. But the amazing results are that God's Spirit with has birthed a new church in Papua. That's the part of Indonesia where they are. Praise God for this, his word that changes lives. Amen? Amen. Only God knows how many dem people have clearly understood the gospel, so please continue praying that everyone who heard would put their faith in Christ's atoning work on the cross for their salvation. Pray for the team as they listen to testimonies and help those that are still unclear with the gospel, about the gospel. And uh, I know that happens every time we have taught uh, in, in that manner. Uh, we had 65 lessons, or 67, I think it was, when we taught. And, uh, but it's been, it's amazing how the Lord uses this when they get firm foundations. In any case, I, we can just praise the Lord together that now there is, if fledgling church there among the Dem people in, in Papua, Indonesia. And also, speaking of uh, uh, Darcy, a little of what's happening, of course, she's in Wyoming, you know, with her parents, and they are still part of the team, even though they can't be over in Indonesia. So Darcy's been able to get more of the New Testament formatted and revisions put in from the first proof check on the Old Testament. And so she's still working on uh, uh, things like that, translation things. And then it says, this month is the time of the year that Darcy communicates with all the West Kalimantan team teams about literacy. She's been busy writing emails to the teams, updating forms and checking with churches to see if they need any materials revised or reprinted. Then 
I just want to um, refer to one more paragraph having to do with her, her uh, brother. Who's Darcy's brother? <laughs> Doug. We were supporting them until they said, give your support to someone else because we're, we're doing fine. So praise the Lord, we were able to begin to support our own people. Anyhow, a special praise to God this week as Doug experienced <coughs> an interesting helicopter flight out of the Wana tribe where he had been ministering. They ran into bad weather, and first there was no way to get over the mountains, but God opened up a hole in the clouds and they were able to get through. Who did that? God did that. And I was just wanted us to be able to uh, uh, share in their praise as God takes care of his people and sees that his messages can continue to be passed on to others. So let's, let's pray for them. Lord, we thank you so much for the fact that the many in the Dem tribe have come to know you now. We just pray for these new believers, give them understanding and clarity and guidance to the missionaries to be clear as they can continue in their teaching of new believers, but also as they go over things, that there'll be more people who understand and accept you as, as their Savior. We pray that you'll just keep them safe and, and uh, keep them <clears throat> as your children, safe from the enemy's darts, and that they'll be growing in you as you begin this church among the people there. Thank you for Darcy and her ministry and Doug and his ministry and the way you take care of your people. Guide and direct them in these days we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, Robert. Thank you for the music today, the mission report. That's wonderful. Uh, turn your Bibles to uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. And uh, we're going to dive into uh, one of a series of miracles here in this book. And uh, I want to thank you, your church, for your support of our local mission here as well as worldwide. Um, we've got some exciting things going on, uh, not just in what we're doing, helping pastors and churches and strengthening them and trying to start some new churches. We've got 30-plus churches over on the east side of uh, Volusia County, uh, Daytona Beach, etc., that want to join with us in what we're doing. And so... That may become uh, official, at least uh, by decision, uh, this week, Tuesday night. So that's a may not sound like a big deal in your world, but it's a big deal in mine because I'll be adding 30 churches plus to what I'm doing. Um, I'll get a staff, another staff member out of it. That'll be good. And uh, that staff member is going to be concentrating on uh, evangelism through events. Uh, we have a lot of that in Sanford. We have some of it in DeLand and Deltona. But over on the East Coast, there's, uh, like already this year, they've had race week. It was several weeks. And then they had bike week. That's more than a week. And last week was Jeep week. There's all these events that you can go and be a part of it evangelistically. And so uh, we're going to be doing better and better at that. But I, I want to uh, just ask a question as I begin today. And I don't know if Brother Wendell's Judy are listening, but um, I appreciate the opportunity to come here and speak to you today. I really do. It's, it's an honor and a privilege. It is. Uh, even if it is 2.30 in the afternoon, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to get used to that if you're, if you're not. Um, but the question is this, will it be enough? Will it be enough? Do I, in other words, do I have enough? Now, the first thing we might say on that or think on that is money. Do I have enough money? Well, that's certainly a, a factor. But, but, you know, do you wonder, uh, do I have enough? Do I have enough money to live on? Do I have enough friends to help me on? Do I have enough strength to carry on? Do I have enough hope to go on? Do I have enough faith to live on? Because sometimes we seem to run low on all of those things. Now, y'all, normally I wear a contact lens in one eye, and my allergies are so bad today I can't, I can't get them to, to work. So I'll be taking my glasses on and off. hope that won't be too bad of a distraction for you. I just realized that I need to do that now before I misread something that I've prepared here. But anyway, um, the story here is centered around a, a widow who just lost her husband. The wider story is what really is interesting to me. In the Bible, uh, people say there are miracles in the Bible. That is absolutely true. There are long stretches of the Bible where there aren't any miracles, and there are other places where there are just clusters of miracles, and this is one of those times. And ironically, 
It's when Elisha, Elijah is 1 Kings, Elisha is the prophet in 2 Kings, and the people of Israel are quite far from God. He continues to do miracles to awaken them and to try to get their attention. And there's one more coming up here. Now this, I don't want to say a small miracle, so I'll say maybe a lesser known miracle, but it is, it is one for sure. And if, you're, and if you're having your time with the Lord reading the Bible, if you weren't paying attention, you could almost read past it and not realize what had happened. But what had happened here is absolutely spectacular, and the lessons we can learn from it are great. So I want to read one verse, and as, as a verse in the Bible can be, this verse is just absolutely unlo- unpack, unpacks the story. Uh, it sets up everything in chapter 4 of 2 Kings and verse number 1. A certain widow of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. Now, folks, we could probably sit around and have a nice small group discussion on what constitutes poverty and being poor. And uh, as, as it's been well pointed out, most poor people in America are richer than most of the rest of the world economically. But I want to tell you this, this is hitting pretty close to the bottom of poverty. When you go to God through the preacher here and you're so poor that they're going to come take your two children away to be slaves. That's poor. It doesn't, it doesn't get much lower than that. So this miracle that God does is not like, oh, just a little help along the way or, oh, now things are better. I mean, things are all together, all together different after what God does. So you have this context here. Now, this, um, this widow married to a prophet. Here, here's a little more of the background. They had what we would call a school of the prophets then, and Elisha was the head of it. There there are several stories where you can tell that. And he evidently was one of those men that that studied under Elisha and followed him and maybe was going to be a successor to him or go off to another area. And uh, he had died, and she's poor. Now, there was oppression here, no doubt, by the government, by the, the Israeli government of all things. And so she's in bad shape, and she goes to the prophet. Now, Understand a little bit more of what that's like. This would be a little beyond going to your pastor to ask for help in this sense. Because, because the Bible isn't being finished written, there were certain men when they spoke things, it became the Bible, and this is one of those times. So this is about as close as you can can come to dropping on your knees and saying, God, I need help. I, I, I have no doubt she had done that already. But the pattern was to come to the prophet Elisha. Now, here, here's, here's the message for us. She had three things that she needed to get through this and to have the victory and to have the miracle. And we, have, we, we can have these, things, these three things also. Um, and the first of those things is the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to I wanna say some things about the Holy Spirit of God, then a little bit more about the, uh, the text here and the story here, and then come back and make it even more personal. I want to say first some teaching things about the Holy Spirit, then I'll come back later and say some things personal for me and you. But when we say the Holy Spirit, we should never uh, use the word it to describe him, because it's it's a he. God, the one true and living God, has manifested himself a lot of ways, but in persons, he's manifested himself in three persons. God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Now, you could probably have said that as good as I did or better, uh, but you don't want to get away from that. They are One is no less God than the other and no more God than the other. There's only one of them that's visible. That's Christ himself, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes the Bible will use the word God, and there's kind of a general assumption, G-O-D, that it means God the Father if it's not specified. Sometimes it'll say the Son of God or God the Son, talking about Christ. And sometimes it'll, it'll interchange the Spirit with God. Matter of fact, one time in the book of Acts, it, uh, in, almost, in almost one sentence, it says you've lied to the Holy Spirit and you've lied to God, talking about Ananias and Sapphira. So, so when, you, when you look at the whole Bible, you see the, the triune nature of God, you get little hints of it. Even in Genesis, before any of us were here, 
God said, let us make man in our own image and after our likeness. Well, he's talking, that's a council of the Trinity. There's no other way to look at that. You don't know that just from that, but what you know from the rest of the Bible, you can look back and see that. Here's the way I like to illustrate it. When we, uh, if you'll let my Bible here, of course, the New Testament is here. One of the reasons we have such understanding is because we can look back through the revelation of the New Testament to see things in the Old Testament, and we can look at the Old Testament to see it uh, shadow, foreshadow and type things uh, for us and picture things in the New Testament. Now, I said she had three things uh, that we can have, and, and we need them, believe me. The first is the most important, but the last one's the key. Um, but she had two things that were going against her. And I want to see if you, you're familiar with these two things. She had two things going against her, fear and worry. Have you ever run across those guys? Fear and worry. They're really bad dudes, okay? They really are. Uh, but I want to remind you of something. When you look ahead at your life or currently in your life and fear and worry begin to grip you, I want you to look over your shoulder because the psalmist said, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. So when you see fear and worry, just remember goodness and mercy are right there on your coattails, okay? They're, they're right there because they'll follow you all the days of your life. Now, you've probably heard this said many times. I'm sure Pastor Wendell has said it. In the Bible, there's 365 times that it says, fear not or don't be afraid or something like that, okay? Does that number 365 ring a bell? Yeah, one for every day of the year. Now, why would God say something 365 times? Because we have a problem with it, and he knows that on the front end, okay? Fear. And um, now my wife tells me that I'm not afraid of enough things, and that, that may be true sometimes, but, but anyway, uh, that, that she makes up for it by, <laughs> by how, how she is. Uh, and she's just, real, she's just uh, more cautious than I am on some things. But um, listen, worry... Worry is believing that there's not a plan of God or you don't know how to get in on the plan of God and you don't know what you're going to do. And fear is afraid it's all going to cave in or, or something bad is going to happen. She had those two things, but she also did the right thing by going to the Lord. Uh, so remember, goodness and mercy is following you. Now, back to the three things that she had, and this is the heart of the message today. Uh, back to the Holy Spirit. Um, remember, the prophet's role, she goes to him. And I want to break down what happened when she went to Elijah. If you look in verse 2, he says something really, it seems simple, but it's really extraordinary, and it's really how we live, and it's how we pray. These two questions that he asked her absolutely should govern your prayer life and my prayer life. He says, Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? Now, folks, look up here. He didn't even wait for the answer to the first question. He said, tell me, what shall I do for you? Then he said, what do you have in the house? Now, I'll follow, the, follow this. You know, um, when I was in seminary, we had a great preacher come, a preacher that's still on the radio today, Adrian Rogers. He was my pastor. And we had a question and answer time with him, and we asked him once, one of the boys asked him, said, Pastor Rogers said, uh, how many points should a good sermon have? You know what his answer was? At least one. Amen? Can you agree with that? <laughs> now, here's the point, really. I've got three points, and I've got some sub-points and all these things, but you ought to be able to leave here with at least one thing that you got from the Lord today. Otherwise, really, if you don't hear from the Lord and say yes to the Lord, we can sing songs till sunset. You haven't worshipped the Lord because worship is, is responding to him in reverential awe and saying, yes, Lord, I'm with you. Yes, Lord, I'm going to obey her. Yes, Lord, I'm going to trust you. Now, I don't know what the one point you might get, but here would be one worth getting. When we relate to God, there are two things. One is, relating this first question, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what shall I do for you? Now, he's inviting her to ask for all your needs to be met, okay? God does that all through the Bible. Because, folks, there are some things that only God can do, okay? Now, God can do anything but fail, and without him, we can do nothing. So, there, so that sure makes a divide. But there are some things that we pray for. I've got things on my list right now that only God can do. My prayer list. I mean, only God can do it. But the second question says, 
what do you have in the house? And here's what God says to us sometimes when we pray. He says, thank you for asking. I've got a plan for that. I'm going to take care of it. In some other questions, he's asking us, what do you have in the house? He's saying, okay, now on this next one, I'm going to be, I'm going to be the main mover. I'm going to do it, but you're going to participate in it. In other words, some things, God, you just got to do this. Other things, God's going to bring me along, and I'm going to walk with him and do it. For example, you can see it in, in uh, Jesus kind of, I like to use a physical illustration. Jesus is with his disciples, and he comes across a blind man, and they know that there's needs, and, uh, and he just heals them, and they got to see it. Another time on the feeding of the 5,000 or the feeding of the 4,000, uh, two different incidents, by the way, um, Jesus Jesus is going to absolutely multiply the loaves and the fishes, but he had them sit down in groups of 50, and he had the disciples pass it out. In other words, there he was doing the miracle, but he was using them on some other things on the healing. He just did it, okay? Now, we need to relate to God on both those things. Remember the two questions. He said, tell me, what shall I do for you? In other words, she was going to participate in prayer, but God was going to do it. And the second one was, what do you have in the house. Those, those things are absolutely critical. You see, one of them is, for what, what only God can do and what he's going to do by himself, we just need him to work, and we ask him to. On the things where we're going to participate in, we need his wisdom and power to follow along with it. So it's kind of two different categories of how we walk with the Lord, and that, that that's very important. Now, uh, let's get back to the answer here because the last part of verse 2 really gives the answer. He said, tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, now remember this answer. It's very significant. Your maidservant, there's her humility, has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Back to the poverty statement. How many of us have said, oh, we're out of milk or we're out of cereal or we're out of bread or we're out of whatever? I don't know if I'm looking at anybody or have any time I preached a sermon that ever got down to one pot of oil. Now, when I was in seminary, we were close sometimes. We were, we were close. Uh, we were, my wife's an excellent cook, but when we say we don't know where the next meal's coming from, I don't know if she did either, but um, made something up. But, y'all, that's really her answer. I've got one pot of oil. Now, I want to be honest with you. I'm going to speculate on something, okay? I'm going to use my sanctified imagination. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, I can't prove this, but I wouldn't be surprised to get to heaven and find out this was true. Every prophet would have had a jar of anointing oil that they used. And I would imagine that'd be the last one she would want to use for any purpose, medical, cooking, whatever, oil lamps, whatever. Now, like I say, I can't prove that, but either way, she was down to one, one, one pot of oil. Uh, so uh, I want to go back to the, whole, the lesson on the Holy Spirit uh, and, and we just don't have time to unpack all this, so just take this statement for, to launch us forward. Uh, often in the Bible, oil and the anointing of oil, the rubbing it on the head or whatever, um, was a symbol of the Holy Spirit's work in and through us. Uh, for example, I'll give you one example. Uh, there's a psalm that talks about Aaron the priest, Moses' brother, how that he had this uh, robe and they put oil and it said it was on his head and it ran down in his beard onto his garment even down to the foot. In other words, it was, it was, sim it was literally uh, dripping down on him, but that was to show that he's covered by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit has him and he's, he is God's man. He's, he's the man that God's going to use. So oil is often a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Now, here is something I'm going to take up, a literal use of the words here and apply it in a New Testament sense. He said, what do you have in the house? And she said, nothing but a pot of oil. Now, l l let me take that word house and kind of roll it forward a few hundred years and now a few thousand years to us. What did Jesus say about us? What did the Bible say? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit that you have of God? and you're not your own, you're bought with a price, that's the blood of Christ. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So if God were to ever ask us, what do you have in the house? You want your answer out of it? I've got the Holy Spirit in this house because he's come to live in me. I've got the Holy Spirit. He lives inside of me. Now, with that said, what does the Holy Spirit do in the life of a believer? 
Well, he first indwells us. His deity invades our humanity. It's not just a figure of speech. It's not just when we say, Jesus, come into my heart. It, 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 that's all true, but it's, it's more than that. It's a literal truth. As I often say, I came up here, uh, this brother and I came about the same time, and we came in, and we were outside the building, and we came inside the building. We weren't one or the other. We were outside, now we came inside. God can work with you. God can do things all around you. But when we repent of our sin and place our faith in the Lord Jesus, the Spirit of God comes to live within us. So he indwells us. And he indwells us uh, to own us, to claim us, and to uh, possess us, and then to fill us so that we have his power to do what he has called us to do. Now, don't, don't get confused about this. Uh, I... I uh, I, I want to know two things. I want to remind you of two things. It is a great truth. It's, it's wonderful to me to even say it to you today that the Holy Spirit lives inside of every believer. Now, let me just qualify that. doesn't mean every church member. doesn't mean everybody who says they're a Christian. It means everyone, each person who has repented of their sin and placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, they've done, he, he knows who's sincere and who's not, and he comes to live within us. So it's wonderful to say that, but it's not. The idea of the Holy Spirit living in us isn't just so it makes us feel wonderful that he lives in us. It's a great truth. But I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's life-changing for God to come and dwell within us, and he wants us to follow him and walk with him. And the, the evidence that a Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has come in is the changed life. Everyone in here today, God owns you in two ways and maybe three. Now listen to me. One, he owns you by, as creator. He made us, okay? Secondly, he owns us by purchase. He died on the cross to pay for our sins. But the third way is the one that kind of seals the deal, literally. The third way is by possession, by residence, uh, there was a long time in my uh, ministry, and I guess I could still do this. I would give an invitation at the end of a service, and someone would come forward, and I would ask them. There are different ways to ask them. Depends on if I knew them or already have a conversation with them. But sometimes here's the question I'd ask them. I'd say this. In your life right now. Well, usually that kind of stunned them because that's what they thought I was going to ask. And then they would think about it, and they'd say, no, that's why I'm here. I want, I want Christ to come into my life, or, or yes, and we, we kind of go from there. But, but folks, um, uh, under, understand what it is to have a, have a changed life. I'll give, you a, I'll give you a funny example. I'm trying to learn Spanish, okay? Now, I've learned a few phrases that when I go to our Spanish churches in our, in our Baptist Association, I can say a few things to them, and I try to get the accent right and the diction right, and they seem impressed. But then they come up talking to me in Spanish, and I am out of, out of it. You know what I mean? Um, so, I, so I say, I know some lingo, but I'm still a gringo. You know what? <laughs> they, they, they laugh at that. I laugh at that. But, y'all, there are a lot of people in church today, a lot of people watching on Facebook in church today, a lot of people not even going to church, used to go to church today. That they know some Christian lingo, but they're not really born again. Now, and, and we need to be alert to that in our own families, in our own household, in our own in our own churches. I, I, I hear people say some things these days that just, I guess it's even though I know it's true, it still amazes me. Had uh, one friend tell me about how they uh, a, a, a family member came to Christ and they were rejoicing, and another member. Um, as I remember reading the email, another member of the family that thought he was a Christian called her to rejoice with her, and he said, it's so great that you've been saved. It's so great you're going to heaven. He said, now I still go out drinking and partying and cuss, but now I'm going to heaven. He, he missed the memo of most of the New Testament about sanctification. You, you, get a, you get a changed life when Christ... How could you not change if the spirit of the living God comes inside you and he keeps on changing you? And so we have these things that, 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 that we deal with, and, and they're important. They're important to understand that, to discern that. And, um, and I just want you to remember, not this wasn't the answer when Elisha asked this widow the question, but it should be the answer when I ask you the question, what do you have in the house? 
Is the Spirit of God dwelling in you, living in you, in that permanent, righteous way? So number one, she had, and we can have, the Holy Spirit. Number two, and this is where it kind of, where you have to kind of meditate and think about it, she had helpers. She had helpers. Let's look at verse three and four. Look at verse three and four. Then he said, now this is the instruction right after she gave the answer, all I've got is a jar of oil. Then he said, go, borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels, do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you, and you, behind you and your sons, then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. Now, if she was really listening, and if you were listening, you just realized he just predicted a miracle. He didn't say go get all these empty vessels and take your one jar and put like a one drop in each one. And what would that, that, that would just, <laughs> you, if you don't have anything about oil, you would lose some of it that way because it, some of it sticks to the jar. You, don't, you wouldn't even get it all out. He's obviously talking about a miracle like the feeding of the 5,000 that I already mentioned. But he says go prepare. Now, y'all help me a little bit here. This, in this smaller group, we can do this. What was her answer when he said, tell me, what do you have in the house? What'd she say? Jar of oil, right? But she really had more than that. She had two sons. And she had more than that. She had her neighbors. Okay? Now, let me just say this for you the way I like to say it. She had faith in that she was looking to the Lord through the prophet. She had family in that she had two sons. And she had neighbors because he said, go, go borrow from them. Now, by the way, let me just make a... Let me, let me do a quick financial seminar, okay? This is not teaching borrow your way out of debt, okay? This is not teaching that, all right? Just want to, just want to be clear. I've actually heard someone say that, that, that the way you get out of debt is you go borrow from a bunch of people and then you get prosperous and I won't even go there. Um, so she's got faith, she's got family, and she's got friends. Now, obviously, she was telling the truth when he said, what do you have in your house? Because she was, it was a financial need. She kind of gave a financial answer. So that, that, that's fine. That's acceptable. But I, I want to say something about helpers. And, and, and actually, she's, she's just borrowing these vessels. After the whole thing is done, she's going to be giving them back. It's okay to use things from other people. Jesus did it. Jesus used someone else's donkey to ride in for his triumphal entry. He had an expensive robe, a seamless robe that was given him. He used a Roman cross, and he used an empty tomb. Wasn't going to keep any of them long, amen, especially the tomb. So Jesus utilized those things from others. That's what she's doing with these jars. Now, why did he say, shut the door? You and your son, shut the door. I'm going to add a little more in speculation. I'm just going to say this biblically. Sometimes God wants to do a miracle, and he wants everybody to see it. And sometimes he wants to do a miracle, and he wants everybody to see the result of it. And the result was going to be this woman's financial fortune changed completely, okay? That's more like salvation. If someone, if someone and I'm not saying this to brag, I, I didn't even know it happened. I was praying for one of our deacons when I was a pastor in Tallahassee. He had gone blind. He was asleep. And I prayed for him that God had given him his sight back. And when I got through praying, he was still asleep. So before I got home, his wife called me on the phone and said, my husband can see. Well, that was one that everybody in the hospital was came running down the hall that he could see. It was, it was, so that's one that everybody saw. But on salvation, you know what God does? God forgives our sins, gives us a home in heaven, comes to live in our life that we've already talked about. And so we don't see the miracle of that, but we see the result of it because you see changed lives. That's what we're talking about here. So he said, do this one behind the door. Do, shut the door on this one. So now I, I want to say something about helpers that she had uh, to you. I would imagine if this was like a, a, a small group, Sunday school class, a Bible study, we could go around the room, and, and I've been asked to do this before, name the, name the top five people that influenced your life toward Christ. Now, i got to tell you, uh, I could do that. Only one of mine is still living. They've all gone to be with the Lord. He's, he's 90 down in Kissimmee. But you could, you could list some people that have helped you along the way, couldn't we? You, you really could. And, and they may, may be already with the Lord. 
what I want to ask you is, are you one of those people that's helping someone else? Are you one of those neighbors or helpers that's helping someone else? Are you someone that someone in need could come to, that God could use you to help them? In other words, this helper thing goes both ways. The Bible says to have friends, a man must show himself friendly. So she had the Holy Spirit, and we can too. She had helpers, and we should be, should have that. And, uh, and she had that, and we can have that. But the third one, I wouldn't say it's the most important, but it's like when I came here, the door was unlocked. You know what that means? Somebody had a key. Now, the door is the, my dad built houses for 40 years. I worked with him a bunch of those years in construction. The door is the most important thing. If there's a door jam, you have a door in it. But it really doesn't mean a whole lot if you don't have a key that works, okay? You got to have a key. This third thing is the key. This third thing is the key to the Holy Spirit and to helpers. It is humility. It is humility. Um, now, I've noticed this. People really seem to be all for humility, especially if it's the other person having to show it. Amen? Y'all you, know what I'm saying? If it's the other person having to show humility, we like it. If it's us having to show humility, not so much. What does God say about humility? In James 4, 6, and this is the third time he said this in the Bible, I resist the proud, but give grace to the humble. What does Philippians 2 say about humility? humility? I quoted this verse to someone this morning. I don't think they got what I was saying. But the Philippians 2 said, let each person esteem others better than himself. And on that, it said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And it says, and it goes on to say that Christ humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. I mean, you can't get to the gospel you can't understand the gospel. You won't even see your need for the gospel without humility. Remember this statement. I've probably given it to you before because it's a, it's a life-changing statement for me. In humility, Jesus came to the cross to pay for our sins. And in humility, we must come to his cross so that we can be forgiven. Humility brought him to the cross. Humility brings us to that cross. Now, I want to remind you of this. Her humility came before the miracle. She came to Elisha. She referred to herself as your maidservant. I'm your servant. There, there's, listen, the fact, talk about faith and humility, the fact that she would follow these instructions, so let's face it, it doesn't make a bit of sense outside of a miracle. Like, mm, are all these vessels? I am going to be so embarrassed when I borrow all these jars and then I turned them back empty, and there's never been any oil in them. But she was humble enough to believe God. So I want to just take a few moments to read verse 5, 6, and 7, and come back and, and just make two points, and we'll be done. So he says, set aside the full ones. And the, 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 the story kind of, the, the scripture kind of races through this, this thing. I mean, it's, it's just in very few words that this great thing is said. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. Did you catch that? She didn't dribble it out or drop it out. She poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full, see how you could almost miss it, that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there's not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go, sell the oil and pay your debt and you and your sons live off the rest. Now, I, I want to say something that is most commonly preached when this passage is expounded on or referred to. And, and I, I want you to say, I'm not, I'm not bashing this. I'm just saying it's not enough. It's most commonly preached at this point. Well, the oil stopped. She got as much miracle as she prepared for. I, I, I'm, I'm fine with that. I, 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 get, I get that application. And some people, I've even heard some preachers say, well, see, if she'd have borrowed more vessels, she'd have got more oil. Well, evidently it was enough, which is my title today, Will It Be Enough? The answer was yes. But the oil stopped. Now, picture this lady. I mean, she's in miracle mode. She's just pouring and pouring and pouring, and she's not counting. She's just pouring 
and pouring. And she says to one of the boys, son, bring me another vessel. And he said, if he's from out here, he said, mama, there ain't no more. <laughs> he said, there's not any more vessels. And they all stopped, okay? That shows the answer to the question in the title of the message, will it be enough? And the answer is yes, when, with God it's enough. With God it will be enough somehow. Now, looking at it financially, here's what I've learned about finances from the Lord. One is there's the Lord's provision, and the other is there's my wisdom and management of it, okay? And those have to meet in his will. It's all centered around giving, for God so loved the world he gave, one of the most striking characteristics of our gospel is God's striking generosity that he would give his one and only son. So we see this, it's like the miracle of the 5,000, God just kept multiplying it. Now, I'll ask you two things, or two, two areas of questions and I'm done. Based on what you know, are you, are you preparing that God would meet your needs? See, what, what this woman did, she prepared that God would meet her needs, she prepared. That's what we have to ask ourselves on the, on the practical side. The other thing is, are you walking with the Lord in the strength and power of the Holy Spirit, walking with others, that's what church is, in, in being a helper and, and uh, walking with other people helpful, and the other is in humility. But I wanna turn it back to the subject that we cannot get away from, and I wanna ask y'all two questions. Okay, now back to the oil. And, and, and it's real straight where I'm going with this. Who provided what was needed to pay her sin debt? God did, amen? Okay, all right. Who provided what she needed for her and her sons to live off the rest? She participated, but God did it, amen? Okay, here's where I'm going with it, don't forget this. Who provided what was necessary for the debt of your sin to be paid? God did through Jesus Christ. Second question, who provided everything you need for life and godliness so you can live off the rest of the cross and the resurrection? Who did that? God did, amen. Do you see what, you see the gospel tie into that? Now folks, I wanna ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes and I just wanna, I just wanna talk to you. Today, if you would say absolutely, Pastor Glenn, I, I am a believer in Christ, I am, I am settled with Christ. I've repented of my sin. I've placed my faith in Jesus. He has indeed come to live in my life. And you, you rejoice in that. You, that's, that's who you are. You ought to just thank God that he, what, 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 what God did for this widow, he's done for you in the spiritual sense and it lasts forever. If there's someone here who has not settled that, today would be a good time to do it. I'll talk with you after the service, but even right now, you can just say, Lord, I turn from my sins. I place my faith in you. I'm trusting you. See, all of us have sinned. All of us have to be forgiven. The wages of sin is death. But God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, aren't we glad today that we didn't, he didn't wait for us to get better. He just came and paid our sin debt. And we praise the Lord for that. If you have that particular spiritual need, now is the time to settle, or we'll talk with you afterwards. But for those of you, those of us that are believers, I want you to rejoice today that God has provided for your, the debt of your sin to be paid. And he's already said to you, now you can live off the rest. In other words, the truth of the cross being crucified with him the truth of the resurrection of his life being eternal and him giving eternal life to us. You know, that's, that's where we live. That's where we live. And we see it all here in this little, little seven verses in 2 Kings that each one of us had said on some level, some kind of yes to you about what you've, what you've stirred in our hearts. Could have been something different than what was presented today, but at least from this, we have been stirred about the gospel, about our relationship with you, about trusting you, walking with you, believing you, being humble, being one of the helpers, having helpers and being one. We rejoice in the Holy Spirit. And Lord, this wonderful song that Marie played. Lord, I, years ago, you riveted the words into my heart of the last verse. 
Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see. Christ only always living in me. Father, it's my great privilege to close this prayer time in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, let me turn the service back over to Robert here uh, for whatever you need to say and do to uh, keep, keep, keep things going, announcements, whatever. Um, I want to say this. I was thinking earlier. I have preached the gospel early in the morning at men's prayer breakfast and early services. I have preached the gospel late at night when the preachers before me on the program went really long. Wasn't me, it was them, right? And now I preach the gospel in the middle of the afternoon because of Wendell Bishop and Grace 360. But I'm glad to be here. God bless you.